Thanks, Brad. Well, good morning, Forest Lake. How are we? All right, Donnie's good. Brad's good. I'm not sure about the rest of y'all, but it's good to see you. Uh, my name is Patrick. I'm one of the pastors here. We're glad you're here, whether you've joined us uh, here in the room or online, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, welcome. Glad you're here uh, and excited to see what the Lord might do in his word this morning. Uh, in 2011, uh, I moved to New Orleans, Louisiana to start seminary. And at that point in my life, I wasn't looking for a relationship, wasn't looking for a girlfriend, wasn't looking for anything like that. And my plan was just to kind of show up to seminary and, and bulldoze through my program and really get out as soon as I could uh, to start ministry somewhere. So that was my cute little plan, and, and God had other plans. So my first semester, I took this a class called Systematic Theology. There's about 45 people in there. I was all in. I was totally nerding out. But, but one night, I just happened to, it was, it was night class, one night I looked across uh, the room there at the seminary and saw this just smart, beautiful, godly, red-haired girl. And I thought, man, that, that's also a cute little plan. And so I, I went home and I thought, let, let me figure out. And so I found out her name was Jacqueline. And I also found out uh, that it was actually her last semester of seminary, and she was going to hop on a plane once she graduated and to go serve in East Asia for about six months, maybe even longer, probably longer. And so if there was going to be anything between us, I was on the clock. It had to happen pretty quickly. So around, uh, it was about mid-December, uh, and th th where she was going to graduate and then, and then leave shortly after. So in late November, right, right after Thanksgiving break, or a little bit before, uh, I, I just decided I've, I've got to do something here. So I did what any self-respecting, uh, honorable, chivalrous, southern, genteel gentleman would do. I asked her out on Facebook, right? I just, I just messaged her. I said, hey, Jacqueline, how's studying for finals going? Also, you want to go uh, grab coffee and maybe get married later? Is that something you'd want to do? And so, so we, and somehow uh, that we did. And so fast forward a year later, and so uh, she was coming back into the country. So I drove up with her family to Tennessee. Where she was coming in, and we went to this, this cabin in the Smokies. And we were there for about a week. And we were just kind of chilling, just kind of adjusting, doing life together. And the last day we were there... I took her out on the deck at that cabin, and I brought my laptop because I'd put together uh, this collage on a PowerPoint, God help me. And so we sat down, and I showed her this collage of pictures we'd made and memories we had. And then I just I got on one knee and whipped out the ring and just popped the question, will you marry me? And, and by God's amazing grace, how sweet the sound, she said yes. And, and, and that, that was really, the rest is history. Now, here's the thing about statements like, will you marry me? Questions like that demand an answer, right? They just demand a response. You've got to do something with it. Like, even if your girl says, ah, golly, baby, I didn't expect this. Uh, let me think about it, which means no. Uh, she's got she's to do something with it. She's got to come back to you eventually and say yes or no. You've got to do something with the question, will you marry me? Because it demands a response, doesn't it? And the same is true in just a far more eternally significant way about the cross of Jesus Christ that, that we just sang about. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ, it demands a response. You've just got to do something with it. And there really are only two responses. that There's, there's rejection or, or repentance. And that's really it. And you, you can try to, to fool yourself into thinking, I don't really need Jesus. Jesus is not for me. But, but not to respond is, is just to reject Rejection or repentance, but you've got to do something with the cross. And we're going to see both of those responses play out in this text that we're about to read. So Luke 23, if you have your Bible, Luke 23, pick it up in verse 32. Two responses, rejection and repentance. 
You can refuse to drink from, from the fountain of life that, that never runs dry and always satisfies. Or man, you can dive headfirst into that fountain, but you've got to do one of those two. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Luke 23, we'll start in verse 32, just to catch you up on the story. So at this point, Jesus has been, has been arrested and falsely accused of being a blasphemer and an insurrectionist, which in the first century was a, was a first degree capital offense, punishable by death. And so he's been beaten to within an inch of his life, punched, mocked, spat on, and he's, been, he's had spikes driven into his hands and his feet, and he's hanging on this cross where he's slowly dying, and at this point he's been on there for about three hours. Verse 32. Two others, criminals, were also led to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on, on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. The people stood watching, and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others. Let, it, let him save himself. If this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine to prolong the suffering and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription even was put above him like it would be for all criminals who were crucified. This is the king of the Jews. Now here, here's our text for this morning. Look at, look at verse 39. We're going to zoom in on verse 39. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking that guy, do you not even fear God since you are undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay, so in that conversation that Jesus has with two different criminals, we, we get both responses to the cross. Did you see that? We get both repentance and rejection. Did you catch that? Some of you do not look like you caught that. So let's look at this in verse 39. Verse 39 again, here's what he says. One of the criminals hanging on the cross began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? If you are, save yourself and us. Okay, so that's the first response to the cross. It's rejection. It's a rejection of who Jesus is and what he came to do that leads to separation from God, rejection that leads to separation. So what Luke tells us is that when this criminal on, on the cross speaks to Jesus, he, he yells insults at him. And that he literally means he blasphemes. He, he basically straight up says to Jesus, are you kidding me? Is this some sort of joke? You're the Messiah? This is the Messiah we've been waiting for? Are you serious right now? I mean, you can't, there's no way you can be the actual Messiah. You're just a sad caricature. Because if you really were the Messiah, then, then you'd blow this place to smithereens and get us off these crosses right now. But you won't do that because you can't. And you can't because you're not the actual Messiah. You're not God's chosen one. Like, man, I don't think that rejection gets any more, any clearer, any more blunt, any more direct than that. I don't believe you're the Messiah. Now, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people who, who reject Jesus as, as goofy or, or silly or outdated or just, he's just not for them. He doesn't, they don't, they don't vibe together. But, but they're a little more tactful, like the guy that cuts my hair. The last time I got my hair cut, we had the conversation. I said, hey, man, where do you, where do you go to church? He said straight up, I don't go to church anywhere. I said, why not? 
I, I love the honesty. He said, I just, I'm not interested in church, and I don't see the point in Jesus. Right? That's rejection too, isn't it? But it's just a little more tactful than this in-your-face, visceral, what are, you, are you kidding me right now kind of rejection. But that's the first response to the cross of Jesus Christ, just to reject it flat out. Not for me. Don't want anything to do with it. Get, get out of here. But, but there's a second response here that I actually think, the, the second conversation that Jesus has with the second criminal, I think it's actually uh, where we need to do some work. So let's look at this. Starting in verse 40. But the other answered him, answered rebuking this first criminal, don't you even fear God since you're undergoing the same punishment? You're also being crucified. Verse 41, we are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve. But he did nothing wrong. Okay, so that's the conversation Jesus says to him. He says, hey, remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus says, okay, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Let's stop here after verses 40 and 41. We just got our, the first of three ingredients. Listen up. The first of three ingredients about what genuine repentance, genuine salvation looks like. Here's the first one. There's an admission of guilt. There's got to be an admission of guilt. Notice what he says in verse 41. We are punished, what? Justly, fairly, rightly, because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. Okay, so let me, let, me, let me tell you what he's not saying. He's not saying that he, he, he's not admitting guilt before the state. He's not saying I'm guilty before the government. And most scholars think that this guy, like, like Jesus and the other guy, they, they were all considered insurrectionists, revolutionaries, rabble-rousers, people who wanted to, to stir up trouble and overthrow Rome. So if anything, this guy thinks he's in the right and Rome's in the wrong. So he's not saying, I'm guilty before the government. What he recognizes, what he realizes as he's hanging on the cross, breathing his last breaths on this side of eternity, is that whether or not he's guilty before the government, he certainly is guilty before a holy God. And, and in that moment, that just matters more to him. He admits his guilt before a holy God. That's the first piece of genuine, life-changing repentance. Now, our culture loves the idea of justice, don't we? I mean, at any moment, you've got 34 different CSIs playing on your TV. You've got CSI Miami, CSI New York, CSI Chicago, CSI Cottondale. There's just CSIs everywhere. We love the idea of justice being served. And yet, for the majority of people in our culture, they just don't seem to be interested in justice being served when the verdict that's read has eternal consequences. They just don't seem to be too interested in justice being served in the divine courtroom where you and I stand trial before God, the perfect, holy, righteous judge. And I've just got to tell you, according to the scriptures, the verdict is not good. It's not good. In fact, it's really, really, really bad. You see, According to the scriptures, our, despite the message that our culture is constantly trying to pound into us, that, that fundamentally, we're good people, right? We, we just have a few issues that the right concoction of yoga and kale will fix. If we can just get that right, we might step into all that God has for us. Whereas fundamentally, the scriptures are going to say, no, no, you're just broken. You're just wicked. You're just evil, and therefore you stand guilty before a holy God. That from the moment your mommy and daddy conceived you, you were a child of wrath, Ephesians 2. That all have sinned and what? Fall short of the glory of God. That, that's all of us. The verdict sin. All of us are guilty. And, and if that's not bad enough news, it gets worse. 
It just gets worse because see, our boy Paul tells us in Romans 6.23 that the penalty for our sin, the sentence for the verdict is what? It's death. See, not, not, 100, not, not 100 hours of community service, not six months parole, not a weekend in the slammer. It's death, physical death, but, but even more than that, spiritual death, eternal separation from all that's perfect and right and holy before the Lord. But listen, like if that's where the story ended, that'd be a terrible story. Right? That'd just be an awful, agonizing, horrible story. But it's not where the story ends. Praise Christ, that's not where the story ends. That's not where the gospel leaves us. Let's look at this in verse 42. Let me show you a second piece here in verse 42. This criminal who's hanging there, breathing his last breaths, says to Jesus after he admits his guilt, acknowledges that he's guilty before God, says what? Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, now we're getting to good news. Now we're getting to why the gospel is such amazing news. Because yes, repentance and salvation involves an admission of guilt, but it also involves the offer of grace. The offer of grace. So you've got to feel the weight of this. This man's sentence and our sentence is the same. Death. Death. Because this man's verdict and our verdict is the same. Guilty. But here's what he realizes. Here's what God shows this man on the cross. Where he's taking his last breaths before on this side of eternity. Guilt and shame and death don't have to be the end of the story. They don't have to be the end of, of his story or our story. Why? But because of the, the third cross in this, in this text, the cross of Jesus Christ. And because of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, do you believe this? That guilt and death have been conquered and they don't have to be the last scene in the movie of our lives. That because of Christ's cross, the offer of grace to cover your sin, your shame, your weakness, your struggle. I mean, I know we got some busted up pasts in here, right? We got some dark, wicked things. That if we were just to project up here the story of our lives, we, we couldn't be in here. We couldn't stand to be in here. It'd just be some awful, hard, difficult things. And yet, God shows us through this text and this man that there's grace. That the offer of grace to cover all of your sin, past, present, and future, all, all of your weakness and failure and, and struggles and hang-ups, that there's grace to cover all of it. The good news of the gospel is that while there is guilt, there's also grace. And here's what's crazy. The gra this grace we're talking about, you can't earn it. Right? It's, it's just, it, that makes a grace. It's a free gift. Like this weekend, our, our girls went to the grandparents' house. And we usually know what that means. They're going to come back with like four times the stuff that we sent them with. So yesterday afternoon, we got a call from the grandparents Hey, can we uh, buy Riley Grace a new bicycle? Riley Grace is our oldest daughter. Can we buy her a new bike? Uh, I mean, okay, yeah, sure. Go buy the new bike. What, what I heard was, can we keep spoiling your kids? Yes. What, do it. By, by all means, get the bike. So they, they bought the bike, and they just gave it to her. They just gave it to her. They, they didn't expect anything, her to pay for it. She's got like four bucks in her piggy bank. They didn't expect her to, to work for it. She's seven. They, they, just, they just gave it to her out of the overflow of their love and affection for her. Listen, that's grace. That's just a free gift of God given to you out of the overflow of his love and affection and generosity. You can't earn it, can't work for it, can't repay it. 
I say this to you all the time, but it's so easy to forget. But you got to get it. God's love for you. His affection for you right where you are. Not some future version of you that's more put together. But God's love for you right now is not based on how awesome you are or how much you do for him. His love for you is based solely on how awesome Jesus is and what he did for you. The good news of the gospel is, is that there's grace to cover guilt. That there's a fountain filled with blood that, that's drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Do you believe this? And sinners plunge beneath that flood. What? They lose all their guilty stains. Well, we got some guilty stains in here, amen? The dying thief, what, what, he, he rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may we, though vile as he, have all our sins washed away. We're talking about marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our guilt and our sin. And there on the mountain of Calvary outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. That's grace. God's grace can cleanse, heal, and purify. It's greater than all our sin. Yes, there's guilt, but there's grace. That's the grace that our boy is pleading for Jesus to give him, as he says. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. There's a third piece here that we've got to get to. got to speed up. Verse 42 and 43. Verse 42 again. Remember me, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus say? Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay, so biblical, gospel-motivated repentance and salvation. Yes, it involves an admission of guilt. There, there's grace to cover that guilt. And here's the third piece. There's a longing for God. Did you hear me? A longing for God. Not just God's stuff. Not just to avoid death and hell. But there's an actual gut level, soul aching as the deer pants for the water. So my soul pants for you kind of desire for the Lord. One of the clear evidences that the gospel has radically changed your life is that you actually want God. You want to pursue him? You want to know him? You just can't get enough scripture and prayer and community. You just, you just eat it up because your soul craves it. That's not what we get from this first criminal, right? That's not the version of Jesus this first criminal gives us. What does he say in verse 39? Aren't you the Messiah? If you are, then just save yourself and save us. That's a version of Jesus that just sees Jesus as someone we go to when we're in a bind, when we're in a pinch, when we need a little help. But listen, that's what we do with plungers, isn't it? Am I lying? Do we not just go to the plunger? We need a little help. We're in a pinch. Caught a tight spot. The plunger at, in my bathroom, and in my house, if yours is like mine at all, Man, it's just gross, right? It's just coated and, and filth. I mean, I had to buy a new one to get up here. It's coated in filth and nastiness. It's got some stories to tell. And for whatever reason, I never seem, I, I only seem to need one when I'm at somebody else's house, never my own. But here's the truth. This is not a decorative piece, is it? Like when you invite friends over for dinner, you don't put it on the kitchen table and all sit around and stare at it. I think this thing just sucked on the pulpit, so... <laughs> It's not a decorative thing, right? You just, you, you go to it when we're in an emergency here. This is going to be really embarrassing. I'm going to get them and plunge when I got to plunge. Put it away as quickly as I can. Listen, that's the view of Jesus that's, that the first criminal has us. And man, it is rampant today. Maybe even that's your view of Jesus. If you're such a good plunger, Jesus, get us off this cross. If you're such a good plunger, Jesus, to get me out of this miserable marriage. Get me out of debt. Get me out of sickness. Get me out of this awful job. 
It's not a view of Jesus that sees him as someone to be followed and pursued and worshipped, much less a king to be submitted to. But that, that's the second view, of, that's the second criminal's view of Jesus, isn't it? Remember me when you come into your what? Your kingdom. And only king to kingdoms, right? If I come up to you and I say, after worship, come into my kingdom. Right, that's your cue to go get help. Because I don't have a kingdom. Because I'm not a king. But Jesus is a king. He's a king who, who rules and reigns over everything and everyone in all the universe. He's a king who, though he has all power it's possible to have, took on flesh, lived the life that we could never live, died the death that we deserve to die, and rose again to conquer sin, death, and darkness, that we might know him, pursue him, and love him forever. That we might spend eternity with the King of kings and Lord of lords. I want to ask you a question. What if that's the reward of salvation? What if that's the reward of putting your faith in the gospel? I mean, yeah, forgiveness, that's awesome. Grace is amazing. Mercy is incomprehensible. Salvation is just incredible. But what if ultimately the reward is that you get God? All of him. Like, what if, what if that's the reward for repentance and faith? Is that you get God Almighty. Because in the end, he's what we want. He's what we need. He's what our soul has been built to crave. I mean, scholars are all over the map of what Jesus means when he says paradise. I just want to say, hey, whatever he means, you're not going to go there if you don't want God. Because paradise is where you spend eternity before the God who loves you, knows you, pursues you, and sent his son to die that you might have life. If you'll, if you'll acknowledge your guilt, receive the offer of grace, and pursue him with all you've got. Or, or you can reject him. You, you can refuse the offer of grace. You can, you can put your foot down. I'm not, I'm not guilty of anything. And you can spend your life building a puny pile of sand that is your own little kingdom that in the end is just going to crumble before the King of kings and Lord of lords. So as we close, I just want to ask you this. What, what are you, like right where you sit, not, not your spouse, your kids, your, what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with, with the life, death, and resurrection of Christ? You've got to do something with it. You've got to respond in some way. Are you going to reject him? Or are you going to repent before him? I'm just pleading with you to choose Repentance to cast your cares and burdens on him, to accept the offer of grace that's on the table, that you might know the hope and joy and life and peace that you spend your life chasing after. That, that offer has been extended to you. And here's what I know. Some of you are going, man, that, that all sounds really good, Pastor. But honestly, that, that, this sermon's for somebody else. I mean, I've done all this repentant stuff been a Christian for 5, 10, 20, 30 years. I said that sinner's prayer, which by the way is not in the Bible. I've walked the aisle. I've signed that card. I've been baptized. Me and you, we're cool. We're good. Okay, listen, if that's true, praise Christ. I mean, yes and amen. Uh, but he, here's, here's what, what I'd want to say to you. Here's what I'd want to press just a little bit. In the Gospels, we hear over and over and over again, Jesus say things like, repent, for the kingdom is here. Repent and be baptized. Repent and believe. Repent, for the kingdom has come. And the overwhelming majority of times, he says, repent, repent. He's literally saying, repent right now 
and keep on repenting day in and day out over and over again. Yes, you're secured in your faith, but repentance cultivates a kind of humility and honesty before the Lord that's good for your soul. Do that over and over and over again until I come back. Scripture just knows nothing of repentance as a one-time deal you did when you were seven at vacation Bible school or church camp. That's just not biblical repentance. Biblical repentance is a continual ethic, a regular rhythm of confession and repentance. Confession of where, where we're weak, where we're struggling, where, where, we're, where we're having. So like every Thursday night, I get together with a group of guys. And we just have a little bit of confession time. Here's where I'm weak. Here's where I'm struggling. I need some prayer. I need some help here. And then, and then repentance. Just making war against the beast of sin that rages in us. Just pull, dragging into the light the dark, wicked things that dwell in our hearts. I got some dark, wicked things. I mean, just this morning, God helped me. I was on Starbucks. This dude was like, what are you doing, man? And the drive through would not go. I'm late. I need to get on the road. So I, I whizzed past him, cut in front of him. And like immediately, I'm not preaching on this repentance thing. And I got to repent. At 7.30 in the morning, we just got some dark stuff in us that has to be drugged into the light and exposed for the evil that it is. So if you're a believer, if you'd say, I'm a Christian pastor, and yet there's no regular rhythm of confession and repentance in your life, I'm not saying you're not saved, I'm not saying you're not a believer, I'm just saying your blood pressure's a little off, your temperature's a little high, because if you're going, hey, pastor, I'm a Christian, and, and yet there's no rhythm of biblical confession and repentance. You, you, you don't read the scriptures. You're not involved in the mission of God. You don't have a growing relationship with Christ. I'm just saying the scriptures are going to ask you in Acts to examine yourself, to see whether or not your heart's been truly changed by the gospel. Because you don't come to faith in Christ and your life look the same after that. I mean, if anything's true of this story, this guy's life was radically changed in a conversation. And we don't get to see the fruit of it, but we see it over and over again in the book of Acts. Life transformation always accompanies biblical salvation. Now, if, if you're here this morning, you're tuning in, and you're not a Christ follower, and I, I love that you're honest about that, I just want to plead with you. Will you admit your guilt? You're not fooling God because, newsflash, he knows everything. We, we just own that, that you're guilty. And then, and then will you accept the offer of grace to cover that guilt? And will you say right now, God, God save me. I, I, I just, I, I'm tired of building my own camp. I want to I submit my life to you. I want to know this hope and joy and peace that we're talking about. God save me. It's as simple as that. And then, and then will you find someone as soon as you can to share that news with, that, that you have responded to the cross, not by rejecting Jesus, but by repenting before him. Because, because the cross demands a response. Rejection or repentance. What's your response? What are you going to do with Jesus? We can bow your heads and close your eyes. A lot of people have spent a lot of time this week praying that in this moment right now, God would change lives, men, marriages, break the bondage of addictions, save souls. So we're just going to give a little space for the Lord to work, and I'll pray for us, and we'll close by singing truths about the cross we've just read about. Father, we thank you for the cross. Thank you for grace to cover our guilt. 
There's a lot of shame, I'm guessing, a lot of remorse, a lot of regret in this room and online. And yet, you sent your son to spill his blood to cover all of it. You made a way when there was no way. You gave us a garment to cover our sin and our shame. Pray that you would meal, that you'd you'd mend and heal broken lives this morning, that you would save lost souls this morning. Help us to acknowledge our guilt. Help us to receive the offer of grace. Help us to walk in, in a continuing pattern of confession and repentance. And give us a longing for more and more and more of you until the day we see you face to face. We love you. We need you. It's for your beautiful name we ask all these things. Amen. Love you, church.